Welcome to BioCentury This Week. I'm Jeff Cranmer, Executive Editor of BioCentury, and today we have the fourth in our five-part series of Back to School podcasts. Back to School is BioCentury's signature annual issue. It tackles a topic of broad relevance across the biopharma ecosystem. This is our 30th, and we are doing a deep dive on talent across the biopharma industry. Joining me to discuss this are... Simone Fishburne, Editor-in-Chief. Steve Osden, Washington Editor. And Karen Koch tesman Senior Editor. Today, we turn to the regulatory piece. What does it take to build the next generation of talent at agencies such as FDA? We also discuss the views of job seekers, those looking to join the industry. Simone, set the stage for us. Thanks, Jeff. So finding the next generation of leaders, which we've been talking about all week, also means filling the pipeline at the very early end. So bringing people in from a broader range of academia and even other sources. One of the key issues that we come across is that people in academic institutions, I mean, there are some ties that the major academic institutions have with the industry, but most don't have any ties. Many of these very qualified students don't know anything about biotech or biopharma. When they do, they don't know what the range of jobs are that's available to them. And we're going to throw to Steve in a minute, because in particular, they don't really know anything about regulatory sciences. So Steve, how are regulators thinking about their issue related to building talent for regulatory agencies, both in the US and globally? So it's interesting. I spoke with Rick Pastor, the director of the Oncology Center of Excellence, and he had a very interesting thing to say. He said that no one goes to medical school and writes on their application that they want to work at FDA when they leave. And I also spoke with people at, at university programs, master's programs that are dedicated to regulatory science. And they said similar things. They said that there's a very low awareness among their students and among students generally of opportunities to work at FDA and I think at regulatory agencies globally. So, so FDA has made an effort to create an academic pipeline, both to study and advance regulatory science and to create a flow of people who would be qualified to work at regulatory agencies and, and regulatory capacity in the, in the private sector. They've set up three CERCES around the country. The CERCES, which are Centers for Excellence in Regulatory Science, these organizations are graduate programs in regulatory science. One of the problems that they have, and which we wrote about in Back to School, is a, a branding problem. No, nobody's heart beats faster at the notion of studying regulatory science. It's just a, it's an unappealing term. The problem is, is that nobody's really come up with a better term or a better way to describe the work that's done at regulatory agencies that actually is pushing the envelope forward intellectually and in terms of public health. Steve, I think that actually gets to the heart of it, you know, because regulatory science, the concept of that is not a broad one. There's actually a lot of very interesting science that goes on in regulatory agencies. And I don't think that many students really understand that they will be actually deploying scientific creativity. Karen's going to talk a little bit about that in a minute, you know, as a concern for students. But, you know, this branding thing is is really important because I think people just sort of think about it as a, I don't know, like a big stultified regulatory agency, or maybe actually they don't even think about it at all. It's probably the bigger problem. <laughs> so I, I know that some people are, you know, Kathy Giacomini at UCSF and so on are really trying to move the needle on that. Yeah. And I think the challenge is to make it clear to students who are going to be coming in at the entry level positions and to higher level people that FDA and the EMA and other regulatory agencies need to recruit, that these are jobs that have the potential to be infused with relevance and with purpose. They're jobs that have opportunities for people to make decisions on a routine basis, sometimes on a daily basis, that affect public health and that create opportunities and create the possibilities for medical product development in more profound ways 
than they would have if they were in industry and certainly than they would have in most academic jobs. That's so important, Steve, and it really jives with some of the other things we're hearing about what, you know, Gen Zs, the millennials, and this sort of upcoming generation of people that really want to have social impact. And social impact in many senses is beyond biotech, meaning um, beyond even making drugs, meaning making them caring about access, caring about health disparities, caring even about the environment, but certainly having an impact. And so if these regulatory agencies can convey that message. I think they're really speaking to the right people with that. Well, before we turn to Karen to discuss people finding their way to industry for the first time, Steve, I think with these issues you're talking about, most people tend to think about them being at regulators such as EMA, FDA, Japan's regulatory agency, PMDA. What are some of the issues faced by regulators in low and middle income countries? So that's really interesting. One of the things I learned in writing about this issue is that fewer than 30% of regulatory agencies around the world are functional, according to the World Health Organization. Four countries in Africa have functional regulatory agencies. And I spoke with the director general of the Nigerian National Agency for Food and Drug Administration, about how she's gone about turning around what was a dysfunctional agency and turning it into one of the four agencies in the African continent that actually is considered functional by the WHO. She talked about a lot of the same kind of issues that face FDA and face EMA. But of course, there are much more profound issues around training and issues around, around the retention of talent. Because as you can imagine, anybody that goes to work at um, FDA, EMA, PMDA, any of those agencies, by definition, they all could have done something else. And for the most part, they could do something else where they'd be earning a, a higher salary. By the same token, they all, after they've had some experience in one of the regulatory agencies, they're more valuable and they could all go out um, to industry or even to academia and do something else. Uh, so. The regulatory agencies in the developed countries have to figure out ways to provide career opportunities, growth opportunities, so people want to stay. That's even more the case in a country like Nigeria, where there are very few people who have regulatory experience. There are very few people who have worked for the government. And once they've done that for a short period of time, then they're highly sought in the private sector, especially in countries, in developing countries where There's interest in creating clinical trials infrastructure, for example, where they need people who understand the regulatory issues, who understand the way that the multinational pharmaceutical companies operate and so on like that. And one of the things that's also interesting is how global health agencies are going about helping countries in Africa and Asia and South America to develop regulatory talent. I spoke with BioVentures for Global Health about programs that they're running in Nigeria and other African countries to train staff so that they can work in regulatory jobs, both for government agencies and in the, in the private sector. And I think there's a, a real need, not only for government agencies to do that, but also for the biopharmaceutical industry to kind of step up and help create this capacity, which once it's in place, then will make it possible for, for countries, uh, low, low income and middle income countries, to have the infrastructure that they're going to need to safely regulate and allow clinical trials to operate in their countries, to be able to collaborate globally on pandemic preparedness, for example, and pandemic response, issues like that. Steve, very interesting perspective there. And of course, if you want to dig deeper into the regulatory piece of back to school, Steve has two stories that you can find on biocentry.com or in the PDF that we've put together of the whole back to school package. Now, I want to bring in Karen. She has spoken to dozens of more junior and new entrants to industry. Karen, what what did you hear in, in these oodles of conversations you were having? 
So the top concern we found was industry's reputation on drug pricing. Another one was cost of living in biopharma hubs, a topic close to my own heart. But a big one that I recall from my own days is this perception that there's less freedom to be scientifically creative. So there's an image problem there that industry needs to address. Right. And it does, you know, sort of think back to what Steve was talking about for FDA. So here's the thing. I mean, Obviously, the biopharma industry globally has got an image problem related to drug pricing. It's not actually just an image problem. It's an actual problem. They've done tremendous things for the pandemic, but at the same time, drug pricing is still an issue. That's got to get solved. It's not going to get solved with relation to specifically having industry entrance. But what it does mean is that when companies reach out and engage with students and individuals wanting to join the industry, those people need to also understand alongside the science, the economics of drug development. They need to understand how drugs are made, how drugs are priced, especially if they want to influence that. So I think that that actually could be something that, you know, while industry needs to do a better job on it, it actually also needs to use this as a way to sort of articulate the other jobs that take place in the industry which involve business development and marketing and commercial strategies and things that, you know, actually use a lot of different kinds of skill sets. And so while I think it's really important to debunk the idea that you can't be scientifically creative in industry, which obviously you can, and those of us in the industry know how much incredible creativity goes on, I think it's also really important to emphasize there are many different ways you can be creative in the industry. Yeah, and one thing that came across pretty clear was that um, a lot of the jobs in industry are dark matter to folks who haven't seen it yet. The idea of, like you were saying, business development jobs, what does business development even mean? It can mean many things. There's increasingly a need for industry to really meet students and trainees where they're at. And I know a lot of companies have uh, robust internship programs and are doing a lot of this work already. But definitely one of the messages that came across was the more that industry can actually show up at a campus, connect with the relevant departments, connect with groups of underrepresented students, organizations run by them, that proactive direct engagement is what will really have the most impact, which is a step beyond maybe posting about an opportunity on their website where the most connected folks would be the ones to find it. Yeah, I have to say, I mean, admittedly, I'm hundreds of years old. I don't remember a single person from industry. And, I, you know, I was graduating at a time when it was like a really hot place to go. But I don't remember anybody, you know, courting students. But I'll actually even extend that. I'm so old that I have children who have now graduated. I don't remember their campuses. You know, um, certainly the army is there recruiting people. But I, I don't think that uh, industry has, has really shown up. And I will say the big consulting firms and the banks and so on, biopharma, not so much. Well, what I've seen is that the companies that are doing more of this are the ones really feeling that need, specifically around manufacturing and around data science. So I've got some perspectives from leaders of those types of companies who are directly reaching out to academic labs, even their HR departments engaging directly with universities. So where there is a need, there is a way and more companies would do well to follow in that mold. And one of the biggest things, though, that we're hearing is that let's say a student does get exposed to industry, does become interested. There's this huge bottleneck just at getting that first job. And one of the anecdotes I heard was the minute I switched my LinkedIn from postdoc to, you know, scientist at a biotech, I started getting all of these offers uh, where I, it had been a really uphill climb before. So there's a lot of room to improve on the entry level that that transition to the first job, both for, say, someone with an associate's or undergrad degree, and it's we're talking about a really entry level, say, research associate position. Two, uh, I think especially on the PhD and postdoc graduate track, they're not really sure where they fit in. Are they entry level? Do their experiences not count? And so the more companies can make exactly what is required on day one versus what will be learned 
on the job clear in their job solicitations, the more people will be finding that bridge into industry. All right, Karen, uh, love the love for the postdocs there. Always. You can go on to biocentury.com to read Karen's pieces that she has written for the back to school package. Hopefully some HR folks are tuning in and uh, we'll take heed. All right. And so ends day four of the Back to School podcast. We will return with our fifth and final pod tomorrow when Selena returns and she, Steve, and Simone wrap it all up to give you the big take-home picture. All of BioCentury's podcasts are available on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple, and Google. Kendall Square Orchestra provides the music for our podcast. The group connects science and technology professionals and other members of the greater Boston community to collaborate, innovate, and inspire through music while supporting causes related to healthcare and education. 